Ever have high expectations for something and then you're let down tremendously? Anyway, today we're talking about Wendell and Wilde, the latest stop motion effort from acclaimed director Henry Selleck teaming up with none other than Jordan Peele. Those two names invite so many monumental expectations. Expectations that the movie unfortunately fails to live up to. It's nowhere near the worst movie I've ever seen, but considering what it's going up against, it's a clunky, awkward mess of a story. And full disclosure, I'm pretty lukewarm to Peele's directorial work. I enjoy them fine enough, but hoo boy, those scripts of his need some fine tuning when it comes to prioritizing their themes over their plots. And if you've watched my The House review, you know how I feel about that kind of stuff. And when it comes to Henry Selleck's work, well, I mean, we got Nightmare, James and the Giant Peach, and Coraline. Now, I honestly consider Coraline to be his best film. The story, pacing, and character work are are simply excellent. Whereas Nightmare and James, while fine films in their own right, incoming hot take, are rather mediocre in comparison. I still have a lot of nostalgia for them, but uh, yeah, they're uh, they're kinda mid, not gonna lie. And Wendell and Wilde certainly doesn't surpass Coraline either. Oh, and Selleck also made Monkey Bone. Which, despite having Brendan Fraser in it, is... it, uh, it, it, it sucks. So yeah, despite the hype these two directors would generate by working together, this really wasn't the dream team we were hoping it would be. And as such, I'll be covering the whole movie to properly assess its shortcomings. Full spoilers ahead, but it's on Netflix, so if you want to do that, you, you can do that. Our story begins with our protagonist, Kat, as a young child at a fair with her parents. Her dad is trying to negotiate terms to keep his brewery open for business, which is a thing that will come into play later. The family are on their way home when Kat takes a bite out of her candy apple and notices a two-headed worm in the center. She screams in horror, leading her parents to lose control of the car and plummet off a bridge into a river. By the way, that two-headed worm? Never brought up again. Her mother manages to get Kat out of the car in time, but unfortunately, the parents sink to the depths of the lake. From that moment, Kat has carried a great deal of guilt with her, thinking she's the reason behind her parents' death. We then cut to the underworld, more specifically, the Scream Fair, run by Belzer, where all of the damned souls get tortured in an amusement park of horrors. This sequence is actually pretty amusing, and really showcases cases that twisted Henry Selleck charm. We make our way to the top of this devil's head, where we meet our titular characters Wendell and Wilde, maintaining their father's hairdo with a tractor mechanism and a magic tube of hair cream. And I have to admit, that concept got a laugh out of me. For all this movie's faults, it does have a lot of zany creativity behind it. They then slack off and ingest some of the hair cream themselves, leading to them having uh, uh, a, f a fucking acid trip. Yeah, they just get high right at the start of the movie. <laughs> anyway, through their substance abuse, they both have a vision of Cat as a child. Yeah, I, I don't really know. It's never really explained, but my best guess is since she'll be the demon's hell maiden later on in the movie, maybe this was a premonition? That's the, that's, that's the, that's all I got. We then move on to Kat five years later. She seems to have grown into a bit of a teenage rebel with a cold exterior, now being forced to attend an all-girls Catholic school in the same town she watched her parents die. And unfortunately, the rest of the town since then has gone to utter shit. Ever since her father's brewery burned down shortly after their deaths, the town has been under new management by Klax Corp, which we will get to shortly. 
Cat arrives at the school only to be greeted by Shaban and her clique of preppy classmates. We're also introduced to Raoul, who is depicting his mother as a warrior battling off the dragons that represent the heads of Clax Corp. Raoul notices Cat arriving and getting into a light disagreement with the girls. They keep egging her on until Raoul accidentally shoves a brick off the top of the school, leading Cat to have a vision of the future. She quickly saves Shaban bond, but before they can share any bonding over that, Cat gets pulled away to meet the principal, Father Level Bests, played by James Hong. He gives Cat her school uniform and has her escorted to her dorm room. She modifies her uniform to fit her punk rock style and makes her way to class with her stereo blasting and sits right behind Raoul. Raoul tries to mend the misunderstanding with the falling brick and be friends with her, but Cat rejects him him, saying that only bad things happen to people she's close to. <laughs> So anyway, class starts, and one of the nuns, Sister Helly, brings in a camouflaging octopus to showcase. Cat comes up to it, but some demonic shit starts shaking up the classroom. Helly takes Cat out of the room to then uncover a skeleton teeth mark on her hand. And Helly is immediately like, Ah, okay, you better trust me, or else bad things are going to happen. And Cat is all like, Bitch, I don't give a fuck about shit, leave me alone. And, uh... Yeah, that was a bit of a weird interaction. Helly just out of nowhere starts acting sus and Cat proclaims Helly is just trying to protect her job. Yeah, the dialogue in this film can be rather awkward, and not to mention very exposition heavy, as you'll see with this next scene. We cut back to Wendell and Wilde, who are talking about how they had their own idea for a dream fair, similar to their father's scream fair. But their father, for some reason, thought of this as an insurrection and had them grounded to hair duty. And we learn all of this from very awkward expository dialogue. Almost every scene in this movie has some form of exposition that all comes from the characters announcing that shit to the audience. And it's easily one of the most annoying aspects of the film. If a movie has such little faith in its viewers that it feels the need to spell things out for us, that's a sign of very weak writing. You would think the director of Coraline would try try to convince Jordan Peele that kids don't need to be coddled when it comes to storytelling, but fucking, well, what do I know? Anyway, so Wendell and Wilde get a message from a gelatinous goo that Cat is their new Hell Maiden. What's a Hell Maiden? Well, it's someone who has a pair of demons at their beck and call, and they're the only people who can bring demons to the land of the living. Upon hearing this, Wendell and Wilde see this as the golden opportunity to have their dream fair be built in the human world. World. So after that, we are then introduced to the main antagonists of this film, the Claxons of Clax Corp. We learn through more expository dialogue that the city council members have denied them from building their prison school. We also learn that Father Bests is actually competing against the Claxons to keep his school afloat. He taunts them by saying the only way to get their prison approved would be if the former council members were still alive. The Claxons, in response to this, uh... Well, they, they just, they fucking kill him. Yeah, I'm not even joking. He's just, he's dead now. What the fuck? That's fucking... That's a fucking decision. Where is this story going? They throw him into the river as we cut to Raoul's house later that night. We see his mother as a current council member hell-bent on uncovering the conspiracy behind the brewery fire. You see, she believes that the Claxons were behind that, and she wants to bring them to justice, thus stopping their prison school from being made. Yeah, well, they just murdered a guy in broad goddamn daylight, but I'm surprised no one fucking noticed that. And while that's going on, we cut back to Cat having a traumatic dream about her parents' death. This dream gets a little too real, though, when Wendell and Wilde insert themselves into her subconscious. They tell her that she's their Hell Maiden, and that she can summon them to the land of the living. But Cat will only agree to this if they can bring her parents back to life, which they can't do. So they lie to her, saying they will just to get their fucking dream fair off the ground. They tell her to retrieve a demonic plush bear called Bears Above. <laughs> God damn it. Which will tell her how to summon them. Huh. 
I wonder where that came from. But in order for them to be brought back to the land of the living, Cat needs a witness. After she wakes up, she sneaks around the school back to her classroom to retrieve the glowing green bear doll. Meanwhile, back in the underworld, Wendell and Wilde discover they can actually bring things back to life using that hair cream. Yeah, the hair cream can bring things back to life. Hair cream. That's gonna be our big plot device for this movie. It's fucking hair cream. I'm sorry, what the fuck is going on? What kind of a story is this? You, you could make the argument, oh, it's really creative and zany, that's why it's good, but it's so... Okay, well, well, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Anyway, we cut back to the land of the living where all the students and faculty are having a funeral for Father Bests. Kat uses this as an opportunity to get Raoul to come with her to witness the demonic summoning of Wendell and Wilde. They make their way to the cemetery that night where the talking bear plushie instructs Kat to say the incantation to summon them. Now, you may be wondering just what exactly this bear plushie is, where it came from, and how it knows all this. And you'd be right to think that. But the movie's gonna hold off on explaining that shit for a while, so I guess we're just expected to roll with it. So Wendell and Wilde make their way to the human world, but miss Cat on their way up. They decide to test the cream, coincidentally, on the fresh grave of Father Bests. They bring him back to life and for some reason deck him out in their finest drag makeup. Yeah, I don't get it either. Father Bests informs them that this town is so run down that there would be no point in building their fair here. But then the father has a flashback memory of who killed him, and decides to trick Wendell and Wilde by saying the Claxons would definitely pay for their fair. Okay. Before we go any further, let's review how many plots we have going on. We have Cat uncovering the truth of her Hellmaiden powers, Wendell and Wilde tricking Cat for the benefit of their dream fair, the Claxons wanting to build a prison, Raoul's mother trying to link the brewery fire to the Claxons, and now a resurrected Father Bests tricking Wendell and Wilde as a means of revenge against the Claxons. That's a lot of bullshit going on. Who wrote this again? Oh, yeah. Jordan Peele cannot write a simple story to save his life. I don't know why he feels the need to jam-pack this movie with as much story fleems as possible, but any other competent writer would look at the script and go, yeah, you need to simplify the shit out of this. I guess you could say the focal point of this movie is Cat uncovering the truth of her Hellmaiden identity, which is totally fine, but the movie is also called Wendell and Wilde. So it's not too much of a stretch to think one would go into this movie thinking their story would be the focal point. But all their story really is is they want to open a dream fair to spite their dad and use hair cream to bring shit back to life. It's... It's, it's not very compelling. And I have to ask, what kind of story is this? Like, how would you even pitch this? Is it a coming-of-age story about a supernatural teen? Or a comedy about two demons with Miracle Whip? I'm... so confused. Anyway, later that night, Sister Helly escorts Kat back to the school and confronts her about the mark on her hand. Helly says she knows that Kat is a Hellmaiden, but Kat wants none of Helly's help and storms off. Ah! Good. Glad we had that scene. Very good. The next day at school, Father Bess announces that he's alive via the intercom. Cat gets pissed off that he was brought back and not her parents, and rightfully assumes that Wendell and Wilde lied to her. This leads to a really stupid scene where Raoul basically reveals that Cat summoned the two demons, but Father Bess is like, well, if you can't prove yourselves, then I don't want anything to do with you. Like, dumbass, they just did- Ah, uh, oh, you deaf fuck. Meanwhile, we find out through even more expository dialogue that Sister Helly and the school janitor were once prolific demon hunters. Oh, good, another- more, more shit in the story. Good. They get into a good old Sam and Dean Winchester angst argument, which leads to a very awkward... scuffle? They- they just shoot rubber bands at each other. It's- 
God, this is weird. Anyway, the janitor also knows that Cat is a hell maid and whoopty dingle do. And we also learn that the bear plushie belongs to Helly and that it's basically a beacon to signal when hell maidens are present in its vicinity. Oh, good. For a second there, I thought that was complete and utter nonsense. Could you imagine? But yeah, these two and their mentor student relationship only ever get talked about once here. There's no further development with them throughout the movie, so it's really, it's not, it's kind of, it's, it's a waste. Whew! You know, this is a lot of work. How do you guys watch movies like this? So Heli finds out that Beerzebub is gone and tries to confront Kat, but she and Raoul make their escape from the school. Meanwhile, Father Bess startles the Claxons with his presence. He says he can get them the votes from the council to build their prison. He introduces them to Wendell and Wilde, saying their magic hair cream can bring the former council members back to life. The Claxons agree to make the two demons and the father rich after they help them, but they better not raise Kat's parents or else uh, no money. Anyway, later that night, Kat meets up with her demons and tries to get them to raise her parents. But as we know, that would be a deal breaker for the Claxons. So the two boys introduce a new rule. Kat must swear allegiance to them and serve them for all eternity. Kat's skull mark hand tattoo thing begins to control her into swearing her undying servitude, which is, uh... I mean, I thought the boys were just bullshitting, but apparently that's real. Okay. Wait, if she's your hell maiden, doesn't that mean you have to serve her? What, you can just pull rules out of your ass like that and the skull mark will just make it so? That's stupid and inconsistent. What the fuck? So while Kat leaves to get the boys takeout because that was their first fucking order, Wendell, Wilde, and Raoul dig up the coffins from the mausoleum. And I'm sorry, how do the demons just have all these supplies ready on tap? Like, is it magic? I guess it's magic, but the film never specifies that shit. After they're done, the boys get high using the cream again, doze off, and Raoul sneaks off to resurrect Kat's parents. Raoul tells them to go find Kat, and, uh, you know they've been dead for years, right? You might wanna... I don't know, give them some context? A rundown, maybe? A quick recap? Like... Don't just send them out in the middle of buttfuck nowhere, oh, who cares. But then, Wendell and Wilde find out Raoul stole their cream and raised Kat's parents, and now they're gonna fuck him up. Meanwhile, Belzer finally notices that his sons are gone. And, uh, he... He, he doesn't do much about it, like, he just... He, he just sits there. Back in the human world, Cat gets wise to Wendell and Wilde's dead raising shenanigans. But before she can make it back to the cemetery, she notices her old home being inhabited. She makes her way downstairs where she discovers her undead parents. Wow, this is actually a nice scene. She even gets to express her guilt about thinking she killed them, to which they comfort and assure her it wasn't her fault. This is really nice. Oh, never mind. The plot's kicked in again. The parents let Cat know that it was Raoul who brought them back from the dead, not the demons. So Kat leaves them to go rescue her friend from the brothers. Kat manages to save Raoul, and they make it look like Wendell and Wilde's demon steed ate them. And of course, they're stupid enough to believe that shit. We cut back to Belzer, still just sitting there, still not doing anything with the information he has. This... this fucking guy. You gotta get off your ass. Anyway, Heli finds Kat and confronts her about stealing Beerzebub and making a pact with her demons. Yeah, she's not happy. Heli reveals that she too was a hell maiden and brings her back to the demon hunting janitor. She says that Kat and her must be blood bonded to initiate the ritual. And wait, what? Oh, wait, why? Why? You're just gonna mix blood with a 13 year old? That's that. That's just. That's fucking dangerous and not sanitary in the slightest. But before we get the resolution to that scene, we switch to one of the stupidest scenes in the movie, where the undead guard members show up to the council meeting and outvote the current council members, meaning that Clax Corp's prison is now approved for construction. And the council members are just like, oh no, what can we possibly do? Okay, yeah, you know how to solve this? They're dead. 
fucking kick them and they'll fall to pieces. They have no jurisdiction here. They are not actually alive. They can't even speak. This is insanely stupid. But no, the rule book states that all living council members get the right to vote, meaning they're overruled by the fucking zombies. Oh, 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 oh my god, this is so stupid. Even one of the current council members is like, in my professional opinion, these men are alive. Yeah, well, your professional opinion means dick if you can honestly look at these fucking decaying mute marionettes and think for one second that they're actually alive. What is this fucking story? So, the Klaxons are celebrating their victory while their daughter, Shaban, finds out about their corrupt operation. But these fuckers are so comically evil that they relish the poor conditions their inmates will have to endure. Admittedly, it is kind of funny, if not incredibly two-dimensional. So, we cut back to Sister Helly and Kat in the Room of Redemption, where their blood bond allows Helly to access Kat's memories. Ah. Huh. Okay, I, uh, uh, I guess that's how it works. We get a rather visually dazzling scene of Kat's life in fragments, showing she was tossed around from schools and orphanages and caused a lot of harm to the kids she was bullied by. But soon after, a monster manifests from Kat's memories and literally starts self-harming. However, Kat is able to regain control and unlock her true power, which it turns out was... Seeing into the future. Yeah, we we got that. She has visions of the future. That was that was totally obvious. Wait, was that supposed to be a reveal? Was that honestly supposed to be a twist? We already knew that. What the f Fuck Jordan Peele. Shyamalan could write a better twist than that. Come on, man. I'm just that was actually supposed to be a big reveal. Wow, how could you fumble something so simple? But then Helly faints and cracks her fucking head open. Jesus Christ. And now, Belzer finally decides to... Okay, you're not gonna believe this. Actually do something! Yeah, he finally gets off his ass. God damn, this movie jumps between plot lines like a kangaroo on cocaine. Back in the human world, Wendell and Wilde capture Cat's parents. Raoul notices this and makes his way to the school to inform Cat. Meanwhile, Cat and the janitor manage to get Helly somewhat healed as Raoul bursts into the room and wait a fucking minute. How did he know how to find this place? Isn't this room supposed to be secret? Yeah. Yeah, it totally is. What the fuck? Right, writers, writers, hello, where are you? Anyway, Raul informs them that Wendell and Wilde kidnapped her parents and Kat is pretty pissed about that. So Manberg, that's that's this guy's name, vows to help the kids save the parents while Helly sits this one out. Meanwhile, the parents seem to be handling the two demons and Father Bests perfectly fine. But Kat shows up with sister Helly. Wait, I thought you had to sit this one out. You said you needed a moment. Can the script make up its fucking mind, please? So Wendell and Wilde are captured along with the father, but the captives reveal they were only doing these nefarious deeds because they were under the heel of the Klaxons. But then Shaban shows up and through even more expository dialogue, she conveniently dismantles all the preconceived notions that the Klaxons were on the demons and the father's side. Wow, thanks for being here just in time that makes things a lot easier for the writers. Kat then has a vision of what the Klaxons will do to this town, destroying everything to make way for their prison. But before they can do anything about it, the earth starts shaking, the ground starts rumbling, and oh my god, it's Aaron! Oh god, I knew we were too late! Oh no, not like this! Nah, I'm fucking with you, it's Belzer. He finally shows up. So he starts throwing a fit about his hair cream and catches his sons in the act of escaping. He confronts the two boys about why they ran away, to which they finally stand up to him. But before Belzer can really start throwing the book at them, something really, really, really 
fucking contrived happens. The snow suddenly melts to conveniently reveal Raoul's art project all over the roofs of the houses. But what's even more stupid is upon seeing the artwork, Belzer is so moved by it, he just gets sad immediately and feels regret for not protecting his sons. Yeah, he reveals out of fucking nowhere that he banished Wendell and Wilde's other siblings, hoping they'd return, but they never did. Oh, what the fuck is happening right now? What sense does that make? What is going on with the script? Does it have a fever? What the fuck? Is this seriously how we're ending the movie? With a shoehorned last minute message about being a good parent? When was that ever a theme or point of contention in the story? They just drop it on us out of nowhere. It's so jarring. I'm kind of... I feel like my brain is leaving me right now. This whole movie has been about demonic marks and summonings, trickery and mischief, and other spooky Halloween shenanigans. Where the fuck does being a good parent fit into all that? This isn't turning red, guys. It's Wendell and Wild. What the fuck? But then, if that wasn't enough bullshit for you, it's revealed that the demons Manberg and Heli captured were actually Belzer's children. And Manberg is just gonna give them back now. And Belzer is oddly okay with all of this. He's not mad at all about his kids being held captive for, well, years. Wow, this script just took a nosedive into Aspol Nation. And to add on to the nonsense, it's revealed that the hair cream's magic doesn't last, and that Kat's parents will unfortunately be reverted back to their dead selves again. Of course, why not? Do whatever you want, movie. It hasn't been working for you, but just keep on keeping on, I guess. But instead of using the last of the cream on the parents, they instead decide to resurrect the dead witnesses from the brewery fire to stop Claxcorp from building their prison. Hooray for the script resolving things insanely quickly. And from there, we get to the final showdown. And I'll just skim through this part because it's pretty predictable and not very interesting. The bulldozers are gonna do their thing, but our main characters all take a stand and through some wacky animated hijinks, they manage to save the fucking day. The witnesses are brought to life to testify against the Klaxons, the Klaxons themselves are arrested, and everything is hunky fucking dory. Man, I sure am glad Raul's mom is just okay with necromancy. This script makes no sense. Oh, and Kat's parents die. Yeah, that's, that, that sucks. But before they die, Cat has one final vision about Rustbank being revitalized into a bustling, fully inhabited town with a brand new brewery. And her parents pass away happily, knowing that their daughter saved this city. Cat closes off the movie by saying, I was supposed to hate myself the rest of my life, but now I don't have to, cause I'm a hell maiden with amazing friends. What does that mean though? But what does what does that fucking mean? What does any of this movie mean? Ah. So that was Wendell and Wild. I don't like it. What a mess. What an absolute spaghetti bowl all over the carpet. Despite the years of labor that went into this movie, it came out a confused, scattered, and disorganized flop. The few good things I can say about it mainly pertain to the animation, but even then, as good as it is, it's nowhere near as polished as the new Pinocchio or, hell, even Coraline. The character work is shallow and incomplete. We get very little little insight into the self-hatred turmoil of Cat, because the film is committed to five different plots. We learn only surface-level backstory for Heli and Manberg. Raoul is just a sidekick. The Klaxons are cardboard cutout villains. Father Bests is just as two-dimensional. Belzer sucks. Shaban, oddly enough, has the most cohesive character arc in the story, but she's such a minor part of the film that it barely matters. And Wendell and Wilde themselves are just Key and Peele as
those goofball cartoons. Which I get was the point, but this is seriously not their best material. You may hate me for saying it, but Wendell and Wilde is actually pretty bad. And hey, I don't like saying that. I wanted this movie to succeed, obviously. Stop motion fucking rules and I want more films utilizing the medium. But I also want a good story attached to it. And no matter how good the stop motion animation is, if the story sucks, then you're basically fucked. Well, I think I've shat on this film long enough. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up the butt. And if you don't subscribe, I'll, uh... I'll take another few months to upload something.